Good day, good evening, wherever you are. I am Pamela Nadell, Director of American University's Jewish Studies Program. I'm delighted to welcome you to episode four of American University's virtual series, Anti-Semitism Since the Holocaust, America, Israel, and Europe, co-sponsored by the Jewish Studies Program and our Center for Israel Studies. As always, I'm delighted to join my colleague, Professor Michael Brenner, Director of the Center for Israel Studies, in bringing exceptional programming to our campus and wider community. I also want to thank the Center's Managing Director, Laura Cutler, for making all that we do possible. Today's conversation, Anti-Semitism and Racism, is the third and the last of the series that will focus on this topic in the United States. I welcome our American University students who are studying anti-Semitism, American Jewish history, and so many other subjects, our local audience, and, um, and many others from around the country and even the world, including so many of our colleagues in Jewish studies who have joined us. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Laura C uh, Lauren Strauss. Dr. Lauren Strauss is scholar in residence and Director of Undergraduate Studies in the Jewish Studies Program at American University. Dr. Strauss co-edited the book, Mediating Modernity, Challenges and Trends in the Jewish Encounter with the Modern World with our very own Professor Michael Brenner. Her forthcoming book is titled Painting the Town Red, Jewish Visual Artists, Yiddish Culture and Radical Politics in Interwar New York. She was an historian for a major exhibition on the history of the State of Israel at the Maltz Museum in Cleveland. And she is currently senior historical consultant for the forthcoming Capital Jewish Museum that just had its groundbreaking and that is scheduled to open in Washington in 2022. She has also begun work on her next book project, a very much needed history of the Washington DC area Jewish community and their political activism. So welcome, Dr. Lauren Strauss, and thank you to these wonderful panelists that we will be with today. Thank you so much, Pam. Uh, it's very good to be here. And thank you all of the uh, participants and, and everybody who's joined us this morning in several time zones. Uh, so I really look forward to, uh, to this conversation with really uh, the two most important voices in our field in American Jewish history, uh, discussing the Black Jewish relationship and all of the attendant um, aspects of it. Mark Dollinger is the Richard and Rhoda Goldman Chair in Jewish Studies and Social Responsibility at San Francisco State University. Um, I believe Mark told us that he's a fifth generation San Franciscan is that what you are? Yep. And uh, he teaches there about Jews, social justice, and the 1960s. He's the author of four scholarly books, uh, and most recently, Black Power Jewish Politics, Reinventing the Alliance in the 1960s. And I want to particularly thank Mark uh, for waking up to do this panel at what for him is 645 in the morning. So Mark, we owe you a double espresso. Um, <laughs> hopefully in person someday. Cheryl Greenberg is the Paul Rayther Distinguished Professor of History at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, where she teaches and writes on African-American history, race relations, and 20th century civil rights and social justice movements. Um, she also apparently teaches about Star Trek quite frequently um, and is doing so this afternoon. So she has written and edited a number of important books and articles, but most relevant for our discussion today is her really pioneering, pathbreaking book, Troubling the Waters, Black Jewish Relations in the American Century. So thank you both uh, for being here. Um, so to, uh, to start us off this morning, you've both told me uh, that you largely agree with each other. Uh, and each other's theses. So that's no fun. <laughs> Forget it, let's just stop now. Uh, but that you come to this topic from different perspectives and that you emphasize different eras. So um, I'd love each of you to tell me a little about your road to this topic. Uh, why did you each choose to write the books that you did on the Black-Jewish relationship? 
So um, I'll start with Cheryl. Uh, thanks, and thank you for having me. This is really um, fun, especially to appear with my friend and agreeable colleague, Mark. Um, I'm, my field is actually African American history, and I had done some American Jewish history, I'd studied it, but I had never written on it. Um, and so I thought that was what I was going to do, and my first two books were on African American history. Um, but you know how it is in the Jewish community, uh, when you come to a new town, all the synagogues and women's groups and things notice who, who the new Jews are and invite them to talk. So with a name like Greenberg, I couldn't fly very far under the radar. Um, so this is the late 80s, and I'd get all these calls from the local whatever and say, you know, can you come and talk to our bagel brunch? I'd say, sure. Um, what do you want me to talk about? And they'd say, well, what's your field? And I'd say African-American history, and there'd be always this pause on the other end, and they'd say, could you talk to us about Farrakhan? This was, of course, the height of the controversy around the Nation of Islam and anti-Semitism. And I thought to myself, I don't know anything about Farrakhan. I'm a historian. But it was, became obvious that I had to educate myself pretty quickly. Um, and so I started looking into it in order to answer the question. And what emerged was this book on Black-Jewish relations. I'm familiar with the bagel brunches. Mark? <laughs> yeah, great to be here as well. When I was in graduate school, um, my doctoral advisor told me that everybody's dissertation and first book is a journey in self-discovery. So of course I objected. And then she said, what are you writing on? I said, Jews and liberalism. And then she just <laughs> smiled. So, you know, so that was that. Mine is a story really of the 1970s. Uh, I came of age and was raised in the, sub the white suburbs of LA in the 1970s. So when I wrote my dissertation, which became the first book, it was on liberalism, American Jewish liberalism from the 30s to the 70s. And I was really interested in sort of the last couple chapters, and I wanted to expand those into their own book. Um, that's my academic answer. The, the more truthful answer is actually my first day of college. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and raised where I was, I showed up on the, on the Cal Berkeley campus, and, and I went to the Jewish student group, because that's what, that's what you do first. Um, and then I went to the next you know, student table, the, the Black Student Union. And I introduced myself and I said, let's start the Black Jewish Dialogue. And uh, my, my Black classmate just burst out laughing at me. And I, I think I must have looked horrified because I was not expecting that answer. And he, said, he looked at me, he just you know, to try to ease my pain. And he said, he said, hey, I'm from Harlem. <laughs> you know? And I knew what Harlem was, literally, but I also knew that he was communicating a deeper truth to me which is you raised you know, a white liberal Jew in the suburbs of LA, you're gonna have one life experience and you raised a, a black man in Harlem, you're gonna have another. And we ended up you know, intersecting you know, our first week of college. So, so we never had a black Jewish dialogue, but I, I really kind of count that moment as the beginning of the project that ultimately ended up with the Black Power book. Wow, <laughs> um, I had similar experiences. So um, on that note, actually, you have both, uh, you've both noted in our, our pre-panel discussion that in your experience, American Jews are very, very interested in talking about the relationship between the African-American community and the, um, I'll call it, and the established American Jewish community, um, both historically and in the present. And, and it seems, Cheryl, to get to your comment about Farrakhan, like the present is always changing. There's always something in the present to talk about. And then what was present becomes part of that history that we're still asked to, to reflect on. There's this constant interest in the American Jewish community. But um, Mark, you noted the other day that in your experience and now, um, Black Americans haven't been quite as interested in talking about Blacks and Jews. So why do you think this is? Mark, I'll start with you. Yeah, sure. So, you know, um, because this is my field, you know, when I sort of was moving about campuses earlier in my career, um, anytime sort of the Jewish student group on campus wanted to have their version of the Black Jewish dialogue, you know, they'd call me up to be their faculty advisor, or they'd have me come and, you know, teach a lesson or something. And, and I'd break the hard news to them, you know, that white Jews are very interested in this alliance and, and Black Americans, and, and Cheryl is really the scholar here to, to explain that they're not so interested. 
And then, no, 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 they're interested. They're going to show when we got co-sponsorship and they give all the answers and come talk about black Jewish relations. So fine. And uh, it, 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 one particular college, you know, I showed up and all, all the white Jews were there and none, none of the black students were there. And, and the Jewish students were all upset, you know, that, that, that they didn't show up. So then I pulled out my pre-printed lesson plan that had the topic, the title, you know, why the blacks didn't show up. The lessons for the Jews, right? And then, and then I taught the lesson because that's that's ultimately what it is. And I, I think I, I, you know, I should hand off to Cheryl to, to give some of the perspectives in African American history. That's that's hilarious, um, <laughs> but also very true, and um, certainly my experience both now and and in the past. Um, when uh, a mini another minister, not Farrakhan, but another minister came. Uh, from the Nation of Islam to talk to, at Trinity, to speak at Trinity, invited by the Black Student Union, uh, the Jewish students went ballistic. How could you do this? This is, you know, he's anti-Semitic, the whole, the nation is anti-Semitic. Um, and they appealed to the Black student group and said, you know, how could you do this? And of course, the Black student response was, we don't care about his anti-Semitism. We don't. We just pay no attention to that. He's giving us a different kind of message on um, on uh, Black America that we think we need to hear. And so, and the Jews couldn't. The, again, the Hillel couldn't understand this. And I said, you have to understand that from your point of view, you are historically engaged in civil rights. But from the Black students' point of view, you haven't done anything. You're just part of the white majority to them. Um, they have all sorts of issues and you're not really engaged in them. Uh, and suddenly you come up and say, wait, where's our great alliance? But you haven't actually been there. Um, and so, again, while I don't think that's true in people's minds and I don't think that's true sort of externally, on the ground, Jews have been absent for a while um, from the, a, any kind of civil rights activism for a whole host of reasons. Uh, and so I think that African Americans have, have shifted towards their Harlem view, which is, what do we know about Jews? They're the ones who own the businesses. They're the ones who own the, business, the buildings. They're not necessarily the ones who show up for us. Um, whereas Jews, of course, remember our glorious history marching with black people. And I think the second reason is that for Jews who really did represent a disproportionate part of the white community, that was significant. But from the African-American point of view, this is the civil rights movement, and this is an African-American movement of which many white people allied themselves. And so the who the white allies were and why is less important to them, I think, than their focus on the agenda. Whereas for Jews, the fact that we were there is really quite significant. So I think that accounts for some of the difference. I don't think it's that black people are not interested in Jews. It's just that it's a much smaller part of their focus. Um, both of you bring up issues that that I, I hope we get to later, especially um, in the questions about, um, you know, you use phrases or uh, make assumptions that I think were true for a while and that we're finding out only in the last few months, especially um, that, um, you know, that we can't assume anymore. So Mark, you've several times used the phrase white Jews. Um, and of course, now, fortunately, uh, people in the American Jewish community and outside it know that um, that you can't make that assumption, um, certainly in the, the racial um, makeup and also <clears throat> the identification, the self-identification of much of the American Jewish community, uh, certainly the world Jewish community. I mean, the majority of Israel's population really is uh, certainly arguably non-white if you consider Mizrahi um, Jews and, and many others. So, um, so that's an assumption that, you know, maybe we should be retiring that, that language and that assumption or certainly questioning it. Um, so I want to get back to that uh, later. And, and also, uh, Cheryl, um, yeah, uh, we're, we're going to go there. You know, the, the, whole, the whole concept of um, one's own, you know, sort of reflection of one's own history and, and sort of glory days versus um, standing up now and being counted. And you told a, a wonderful story the other day when we were talking about, uh, you brought out the point about women about the fact that women in both communities uh, have been really at the forefront of a lot of the activism. And then a lot of people don't realize that because um, many times men have uh, 
stepped in and taken leadership roles uh, in projects that were begun by American Jewish women and by black women. Um, so I just want to ask you for a minute, you know, to talk to reflect on that role and um, how that then reflects on sort of our glory days. Yeah, I think it's a great and understudied question. People have looked at it, but not enough to my mind. Um, and in a way, by the way, it reflects also your point about we're not all the same, all, all Jews. I would add Southern Jews are not like Northern Jews. Religious Jews are not like non-religious or less religious Jews, right? There are German Jews, I mean, historically, and Eastern European Jews. There's all kinds of divisions. But I think when we get there, that, that when we say sort of white Jews, we're talking about the mainstream establishment and how they, in fact, ignored other groups. And so we'll get there, I know. But I just wanted to say that in a way, that's the story of women also. And black women in the civil rights movement and Jewish women, that if you look at any civil rights activity, it is virtually always the women who organize it. And it is virtually always the men who get the credit because they become the spokespeople for various sorts of reasons. Um, and so that's true in the Jewish community, it's true in the African American community, but the example here that I would point to is that the National Council of Jewish Women made, uh, cooperated, collaborated with the National Association for Colored Women in the 1890s. They were lobbying against poll taxes by in like 1910. And Jewish uh, mainstream groups that is led by white men were not doing so. Uh, they recognized the problem, but they weren't getting involved. And so there was a very close bond. Friendships, and people came and visited each other, you know, Mary McLeod Bethune and, and leaders in the women's, the Jewish women's group uh, groups would visit each other in their houses while male Jews were still saying, oh, oh, let's, let's uh, be careful here. So yeah, all the way through, it's been the women doing the grunt work on the ground organizing, um, and it's been them taking leadership. The, uh, another example is when there were protests about black people not being able to use stores. In Baltimore, a women's group, a Jewish women's group organized a boycott of the department stores and wrote a big petition that said, right, we won't, we won't <coughs> shop there until you allow black women to use the um, changing rooms and, and to try on clothing too. So it was, a, they are very early and they're on the ground in ways, both black and Jewish women, in a way that really men weren't. And you're right that that, I mean, why don't most people know that story? Exactly. Um, and it lasted that, longer yeah. too. After the sort of fallout of the other stuff, there were still black and Jewish women working together on right. the ground. Right. And, and we're hearing this a lot from um, Black Lives Matter right now about the extent to which it's such a women-driven uh, movement in, in many ways. Um, and, uh, and, and I'm, I'm just wondering, and we can get back to this, but from the historical perspective, whether any of that earlier activism uh, in the 1890s, as you say, turn of the century, has to do with the um, anti-Semitism and anti-Black racism in the, uh, in the white established uh, suffrage movement. And, you know, so many leaders of American women's suffrage uh, were anti-Semitic and, and very racist. So, you know, I'm wondering if that was a factor. Uh, really interesting to, to go back and look at it as, you know, as both of you have done in your scholarship, as definitely an earlier phenomenon um, in every way than most people who just focus on things starting in the 1960s. Um, so along those lines, uh, it uh, occurs to me in, in my own work that um, a lot of the, if not most of the Jewish activists who fought for social justice in America through the decades, certainly of the 20th century and a little bit earlier, were associated with the left, uh, in the political left. And so if you agree with this, and we could go through the decades and give examples, um, why do you think this is, both formally and, and informally? Um, so Mark, do you want to start with that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so first I agree. And, and I'm interested in this question, not only as a question of the left, but a question of American Jewish historical memory. 
because what's happened here is the predominance of Jewish leftists in civil rights activism has been sort of co-opted and internalized by a mainstream non-leftist American Jewish community as if they were the ones who had done it. Um, in sort of the classic formulation of why you know, white Jews you know, went to help in the civil rights movement, the arguments were historical that blacks and Jews have a common history um, of oppression, sociological, blacks and Jews know what it is to be marginalized. And then, and then the third, which is a religious argument, Judaism, social justice, you know, tikkun olam, my two favorite new words in the English language, you know, demand, <laughs> demand that, that Jews get involved in this sort of stuff. And the early historiography all reflected these three assumptions, except, um, you know, as Cheryl has written, the African-American and Jewish-American historical experience could not have been more different. By the time the Black Jewish Alliance arises in the 1950s, you know, Jews have made it in the mainstream. And the most religiously traditional Jews, are the, the Orthodox, are the least involved in civil rights. And those, let's just say it because, you know, we're, we're on recorded Jewish socialists and communists um, are, are actually the ones who are disproportionately represented. And they are the ones for whom organized religion is the least, you know, the, the, the least interesting. So, so what, what we have here is, is really those on the secular left getting involved in grassroots protests as allies. And then, you know, my, my interest is sort of, you know, national Jewish organizations all internalizing them um, and historicizing them in, in ways that just didn't apply outside of the left. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think my guess is that um, the reason that it emerges on the left first is that this is a left agenda from the beginning, right? The ruling class is trying to divide us by ethnicity and race and religion. And so we have to get together and fight, uh, fight them together. And so who are these marginalized workers? They're immigrants, they're um, African-Americans, right? And so that's where, they're, that's where they're working. Other white immigrants are busy trying to assimilate into white culture, and they may not be as active in these, in these efforts as a result. But Jews, these Jews, these working class Jews, and again, not German Jews, but the, these Eastern European um, Jews who are on the bottom and come often from more leftist traditions, um, organize with, uh, with them in that, in that sort of leftist way. Again, the mainstream white Jewish community is sympathetic, but they're much more reluctant to get involved. They weren't involved in the abolitionist movement. You know, this claim about Jewish religion committing us, as Marx said, is if that were true, we would have been in, in the forefront of a lot of other things. Um, but it's this sort of focus on working class solidarity as well as the marginalization, I think, that um, leads the left to come first. So that when it becomes a mainstream thing, then we embrace it because after all, we're all Jews and we justify it in all these various um, different ways. But the, you know, the forward, the Jewish daily forwards were in the early, in the teens, they were already calling um, lynchings pogroms. And um, they were already making those links and uh, between the two communities. Yeah, earlier than that, and not only the forwards actually, um, uh, Der Tog and and oh, other um, yes. other popular mainstream Yiddish daily newspapers have. Uh, this is what I'm writing about actually. Have art that really reflects um, uh, racial injustice in America, and uh, and yes, and and to your point, right? They're they're using the Yiddish uh, press, which has um, the the largest number by far the largest number of articles of any media in America outside the specifically black press right. um, about lynchings and about uh, anti-black racism, they are using the language of anti-Jewish oppression. Mm -hmm. And very much so. Um, using pogrom, they call lynchings autos de fe. The auto de fe meaning the the burning um, in the town square in, during the mostly Spanish Inquisition. Um, so, you know, this is a clear choice. They could have chosen other words to describe these and they could have not covered those events. There's clearly something deeply internalized in the Jewish, and I agree with you, of course, mostly East European 
uh, leftist psyche, but, but not only the clear left, that this is our story also. Right. Um, so, and, and of course the Communist Party, uh, which doesn't come along, you know, formally un until the 20s, until 1919 and the early 20s, um, has, as part of its mandate, it's, it's a formal directive to its members that, uh, to its you know, white members, that there needs to be interracial mingling. And so those are the only places really that you have social events that are multiracial, that you have, you know, party parties, communist party parties that have um, blacks and whites uh, becoming friends and dating, et cetera. So that's all part of it. So it's partly political mandate. It's partly social. Um, and in the Jewish imagination or, or not just imagination, really in the Jewish experience, it's also experiential and they see themselves. And I have quotes from um, some of the people I study saying blacks are America's Jews. So that's very, you know, that, that, that's very poignant. Um, so before we talk about some of the problems between communities that both of you have brought up, um, why, uh, besides the, the issues that we've just talked about, um, why do you think that these strong bonds existed, not only coming from the Jewish perspective, but also um, there definitely are strong feelings that we shouldn't, you know, smooth over or, or ignore, coming from the black community. One great example uh, that's starting to be better known is the example of, of HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, uh, acting to rescue some Jewish scholars from Nazi Germany and from other European countries uh, during the war. So what, are, what do you think are some of the reasons for those positive bonds of affiliation? Uh, so, um, Mark, you want to start? I'll, I'll jump in first. Okay, so um, especially for the students in the class, you know, uh, my work is more historiographic than historical, which means it's less about actually writing a full and complete history of uh, Blacks and Jews, and it's more about looking at how different generations of academic historians have described it over time. So. My piece is less about your question, you know, Lauren. Um, it's, it's less about sort of all the good stuff because there's a lot of books on that, right? And I'm trying to sort of make it more complex. But with the question, it's important to say, you know, white Jews were disproportionately represented. And if you compare white Jews to Protestants, Catholics, any other religious group, or even other white, white ethnic group, um, Jews were pr prominent and, and the most prominent. And um, part of that was, in fact, an internal sense of, of ethics, whether that was coming from the socialist left or, or you know, for some later on, their, their interpretation of prophetic Judaism. A lot came from Holocaust show awe consciousness, um, a sense, especially in the first few years after those atrocities were, were known, a, a sense of that. Um, one was a, a sense of oppression, even though American Jewish history was, you know, pretty good. Um, all of Jewish history hasn't been and that consciousness came into play. Uh, and there's also a sense of what, what is American democracy? And, and you know, you're lying about, you know, being the Jews of America. If, if Jews have historically had experiences of marginalization under totalitarian regimes, the best thing for, for Jews is pluralist democracy. And the test of pluralist democracy in the United States is a treatment of Black Americans. So there is a lot of commonality, and, and, and I think a little later we'll get into the anti-Semitism, racism connections. But I, I do believe that, of course, there are mutual interests and there is disproportionality, um, which needs to be part of the conversation too. Sure. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, and, and again, it's a question of what you're gonna emphasize. Come on, disagree, disagree. Well, I, I will, I will in a minute, but I was gonna say that, but I think that, the, and I think the, um, the embrace of in the mainstream white community of that sort of Jewish ethic is an example of how we then re-examine our history in the light of this reality and say, oh, look, prophetic Judaism, blah, 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 right? They weren't making that argument in the abolitionist movement, but they certainly were making it now. So I, I completely agree in that, in that sense. What I wanted to focus on, though, was the other piece of your question, which is about the African-American link. Um, which is fascinating in a way. And of course we can all quote Harriet Tubman, the Moses of her people and you know, this identification of enslaved uh, people with 
the um, Israelites in, in Egypt. So there's always been a sort of biblical sense of collaboration, uh, or at least identification, I mean. Um, and I think that for African Americans, they recognize those links even moving into the um, early 20th century. And so uh, when they looked around, they knew perfectly well that alone they were not going to succeed in getting um, civil rights, et cetera, et cetera. So from the beginning, the NAACP, groups like that, which Mark is right, Jews were disproportionately represented among the white folks who founded the NAACP. They keep reaching out to Jewish groups and saying, would you join us? We know that your oppression and our oppression is similar, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's really Jews who resist, or mostly, um, who mostly resist saying, yeah, we know, but we're too worried about this. And that really, they come around, and I agree with Mark here, with the rise of fascism, although I put it a little bit earlier um, than he would. But for the African American community, they keep pointing to the Jewish community and saying, you should understand us. You should be with us. Um, this makes, you are most, um, you should be the most sympathetic to us because you know. So they're the ones making the link very, very early about um, the similar trajectories of African Americans and Jewish Americans. And of course, during this period, there was strong anti-Semitism, right? Jews succeed despite that, and we can talk about whiteness, but the fact is there was anti-Semitism that had an impact on, on Jews, and so the common cause argument made sense from that perspective. So even in the 20s and 30s, you've got articles in the black press about making common cause with Jews, and they also used it sort of strategically because, of course, Jews, Eastern European Jews largely, and German Jews, who were were more involved in black lives than other Jews. This is in the North, of course, um, that I mean, because they, it was their neighborhoods that African Americans are moving into. It was they, they who were more willing than others to go into black communities for a variety of reasons and open stores and, and serve them. So when African Americans would be angry at exploitation or whatever, they would point to the, they would go to these Jews and say, how can you do this? You should know better. And really, it's around the wartime that Jews come around and start saying, oh, yeah, maybe we should be better. But all the way through, Black groups and Black activists are trying to make common cause with Jews to remind them that maybe now they're the exploiters, but they shouldn't be, because historically, they've been exploited, too. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that is really fascinating. Um, I, uh, yeah, Mark. Yeah, I was gonna say, if I can jump in, because I think I might have something that Cheryl and I disagree with, but I'm not sure. <laughs> you asked about historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs around this, and I'm, you know, I'm really curious because, uh, Lauren, you'd mentioned this movie, I think that was, it's called From Swastika to Jim Crow, with a documentary on this, and I, and I actually, you know, uh, viewed, viewed the film on a panel, and I was actually quite disappointed. Um, with what I was hoping to see and what I saw, right? Um, first, you know, just in terms of filmmaking, and, and I'll, I'll just open by saying there were incredibly wonderful stories of the personal connections made between Black students and Jewish refugee professors. Mm -hmm. And as you heard people telling their stories back and forth, it really warmed the heart. And I saw that the narrative that was written was really an old one in terms of the historiography, that to be more truthful, the lowest paying and least prestigious pro professorial jobs sadly were in HBCUs in this era because they were not well funded um, and, and they had trouble. So, so maybe it was an altruistic idea of helping to save the Jews, but what I read was this was a job they could get to save their lives. And as soon as they could get themselves out and find what they would, I don't know, what, what could be considered a real job, right? With a regular salary in a, in a white dominant institution, they took them. So for me, it was more trying to force an earlier understanding of the relationship than it was an actual reflection. And, and you know, Cheryl, I'd just be curious since, since this is more your field. Well, I was gonna say, un unfortunately, Mark, we agree. Um, in, in the sense that, um, I think what happens first, and again, why I say I sort of predate um, the argument from, from where you do about alliances, that I think the first thing that happens in both communities is a recognition that they are 
that their own issues can be combated more effectively if they reach out. In other words, it is totally self-interest, but it's what I call a spacious self, a self-interest. And so early on, HBCUs, you're absolutely right, recognize that there's an opportunity here to get to hire faculty because there are these Jewish refugees coming from Germany who are well-educated and can't find jobs. And for the, these refugees, these are jobs. So it's absolutely self-interest. The argument of the book and the film, which I actually agree um, largely, is that that sort of spurs this black Jewish organizing and, and sympathy. And I think I agree with you there too, Mark, sorry, um, that there are very close bonds, but it's not clear that this becomes sort of sustained activism so much as again, mutual self-interest and help. And that's not to disparage what they did, but these people are living in the South and these are Jews, particularly refugee Jews who know how vulnerable Jews are. And they are really reluctant to take any steps that are gonna alienate them from the local community. So it's a very dicey position for Jews yeah. to, to be in. And while I think they do in fact embrace the idea of civil rights, it's way more complicated. They are way more hesitant than we think when we tell the story from, from the future. So I think you're absolutely sorry. Right, Mark. It's very complicated um, and it and it changes. And there and and one thing that I, I think is important to realize is that it's not a um, sort of a clear trajectory that, that moves in a certain direction. Uh, from the beginning of the 20th century until now. And uh, there are things that, that bring what we might think of as progress back a little bit. So that uh, actually, Cheryl, to push back a little bit on your assertions about the, the Jewish community um, being somewhat resistant to the black community reaching out in the early part of the century, uh, I think, you know, first of all, the, it, it wasn't only the, you know, the, the real dedicated radical leftists, the communists, but um, these sentiments of sympathy with the black experience in America uh, that, as we mentioned before, are in the, the forwards, the, the Yiddish Daily Forward um, and Der Tag, the forward in the 1920s has a quarter of a million subscribers. Right. And that means many, many more actual readers because people share, uh, people share copies of the newspaper. That's a lot of people reading every day. And there are on a regular basis stories that are almost completely sympathetic, uh, not only uh, about lynchings, but the race riots of the 1920s, et cetera. And so, you know, that's really, that's a significant part of the American Jewish population. So, Absolutely. you know, so only kind of thinking about what the leadership of certain establishment organizations may, may have said, and, and frankly, many of them are sympathetic as well, it, it doesn't really account for the fact that there are masses of people who are, are actively reading that um, and, uh, you know, and, and moving uh, to, to be supportive in different ways. Um, and, and it's not only the, a matter of the NAACP reaching out, the NAACP is Jewish and black. Um, that, that's who found it, the Spingarns, et cetera, right. who found it. So it's really, as you both keep saying, it's so complicated. And then, you know, and then there's this break in, in a certain way in the post-war era with the rise of communism and American Jewish fears about being perceived as too radical because of the, you know, the, because of the red uh, threat in, in this country. I want to move to um, the so present can, moment can before we... Um, can, can I, I'm sorry, can I just wanted to say that, you're, first of all, I think you're, you're right. There's a widespread um, argument, but, and this may be speaking to the next question, I don't know, but um, I think the difference is Jews are, and again, you're absolutely right, Jews by and large are quite sympathetic to the plight of black people in the early 20th century too. Your, and all your evidence points to exactly that. I think the difference is that Jews see themselves as being active, pro, proactive in, in terms of race relations by serving black people in their stores, by you know not running away, that kind of stuff. So that they see themselves as engaged in positive race relations. African-Americans, of course, see them as white people who are exploiting their community. And so 
I think simultaneously, you have a Jewish sense of sympathy, hey, we're here, and an African-American sense of awareness of racial exploitation, you're white, you are taking advantage of us, not because you're white, but you're white, so you own the buildings and the stores, you're taking advantage of us by higher prices or not hiring us or whatever. So that at the same time, what's invisible to Jews, which is the class difference um, and the whiteness difference, is much more visible to African Americans. So there is that tension. I think you're absolutely right. Jews are very sympathetic. And why wouldn't they be? Every every Passover, right? We were slaves in the land of Egypt. We never get far from that idea. But we don't see our the other side of the um, of the equation. So I totally agree, but I think it's complicated even then. Always oh, right. So speaking of complicated, <laughs> we're in 2020 doesn't get more complicated than 2020. Um, so moving uh, to the present moment, um, I don't have to tell anyone, uh, any of you or, or listening that we've seen, unfortunately, uh, we've seen a precipitous rise, to put it mildly, uh, in the activities of racial extremists in this country and, and Europe and elsewhere uh, who target Blacks, Jews, new immigrants, uh, you know, Asians, and others they find objectionable. Uh, but there are a number of experts, uh, including people like Eric Ward, who is an, Amer an African-American scholar of racial and ethnic justice. He was at the Ford Foundation, now he's at the Southern Poverty Law Center, um, who assert that more than any other hatred, it is anti-Semitism that is at the center of white supremacist ideology. Uh, so Ward, in, in his article, Skin in the Game, Ward writes, quote, <clears throat> anti-Semitism forms the theoretical core of white nationalism. And yet, while those forces, while the white nationalists, uh, neo-Nazis, uh, they see Jews as certainly non-white and uh, as a threat to the white race who are seeking to destroy it, uh, economically, uh, etc. Many people see Jews as being white themselves uh, and uh, and enjoying what we call white privilege. It is white privilege. Um, and, and meanwhile, ironically, sort of in the middle of that, the as we were saying before, the American Jewish community is actually much much more diverse than many people realize. Um, so how then? can we come up with a more useful language that avoids absolutes, you're white, you're not white, it's racial, it's class, and instead focuses on exposing the hatred, exposing this, this vitriol in the white supremacist community and also in the black community. Um, and definitely, I mean, you sort of uh, quickly mentioned Farrakhan before in your introduction to this and, and um, it's, I see totally what you're saying from the perspective of the people you were talking to um, from the black community of why they might not focus as much on anti-Semitism as part of his narrative, but we need to, we need to. Um, and so how, how can we get something that's useful out of this aside from arguing about, yes, they're white, no, they're not white. So Cheryl. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a huge question. And obviously if we knew the answer, we would be, um, uh, broadcasting it from the rooftop, so I need to be humble about this, but um, I think, first of all, I think there, the link is, um, and, the, and the reason that I agree with uh, Ward on this, is that for white supremacists, they hate black people, they hate whatever, because they are taking over, I mean, there are more of them, they're taking their jobs, they're whatever, but they really hate Jews, and the reason I think the anti-Semitism is there is because of something I think you said in our previous conversation, Lauren, um, which is that what they believe is that the Jews are controlling it. So the black people, the immigrants are taking over in that sort of insidious way, but the people pulling the strings are Jews. And so that's what links the anti-Semitism to the racism, it seems to me, in the white supremacist movement. And that has always been the case. So um, again, the question of how to, how to challenge it, how to challenge it in the black community, I think is, a, is one question. How to challenge it in the broader community is, I think, to continue to advertise it. 
So the Anti-Defamation League, way back in 1941 or something, runs this ad that says, the Klan is a threat today. And the text is, right now, the Klan is attacking black people. But you know, they really hate Jews. They really hate Catholics. They're going to come after you. So fight it now. So I think the more, oddly, the more open that the suprem white supremacists are about Jews, the more you can point to that insidious um, characterization to say, look, that is as dangerous as the racism, right? The people carrying around signs during COVID saying Jews are the real plague. You know, you, that's obvious. So in a way, it's easier to identify those, those points when people say, well, I don't think anti-Semitism is really relevant anymore. I don't think it's important. You point to that and say, really? So in a way, they've opened up the space to talk about it, which I think may be part of the answer. Thank you. Um, and Mark, before we go to some questions from the audience, we're getting some great questions. Do you want to? Yeah, sure. So first of all, I'd like to offer an historical challenge to this notion on Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam that, that, that we need to, because um, I, I've, I found this the most fascinating part of, of my research on, on the recent book. And I'll tell you, when I'm doing these Zoom lessons on whatever it is, the first question is on Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam. It doesn't matter what I was teaching. And even when what I was teaching had nothing to do with them, that's always the first question. So I am actually, as a scholar, less interested in what Farrakhan is saying and more interested in the American Jewish reaction to him. I find that to be meaningful because when I studied uh, Elijah Muhammad, who led the Nation of Islam in the 1950s, I found that national Jewish organizations were discounting the anti-Semitism. And Elijah Muhammad was anti-Semitic. He, he gave a, a talk in 1959 where he said that Jews were Christ killers. And, and a memo that, that came out afterwards from the Jewish organizational establishment said they didn't think it was anti-Semitic. Time Magazine did a cover story calling him an anti-Semite and a reverse racist. And the ADL sent out to all of its regional offices a confidential memo that said ignore Time Magazine. Um, in the 1980s, uh, Louis Farrakhan had the lower right-hand corner of the ADL's website 24-7. Where, where is he? The Nation of Islam has been anti-Semitic from the 50s till now continually, but the organized Jewish community has responded to that anti-Semitism in wholly different ways. So for me, as a scholar of American Jews, the, the interesting question is, is on the Jewish reaction to, to the nation rather than the nation itself. Mm. Thank you both. We're going to go to some of these great questions that are uh, rolling in. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to, uh, as we like to do in, in our uh, series, give priority first to students um, who are asking <coughs> questions. And um, I'll start with uh, my fantastic student uh, who's also studying uh, with Professor Nadell, Pam, uh, Ethan Friedland, who would like to know, and I, and I actually have to say as an aside that Ethan Friedland is the person who first sent me Eric Ward's article, uh, Skin in the Game. So Ethan knows what he's talking about. Uh, and he says what he gathered from Troubling the Waters from Cheryl's book um, is that the Black Jewish Liberal Alliance culminated with the legal victories of the 60s, but did not eradicate structural anti-Blackness. Uh, so taking into account racist judicial prison and policing systems, uh, redlining segregation, that whole legacy, um, do you think, and, and I'd like you to turn this obviously to the, the perspective of where it involves Jews, um, can liberalism go any further than what it accomplished in the 1960s? I'm going to say, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> it's a great question. And I think um, the answer is yes, if you redefine what liberalism, how liberalism is, un is understood. I think the reason, and what he's referring to in, in my book, is the argument that the Jewish liberal establishment believed that racism was, was individual because liberalism focuses on the individual, not the group. And the best example of that is that uh, in the 1970s with the uh, affirmative action cases, Jewish groups came out in opposition 
to affirmative action, saying, no, 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 the law has to be race blind. And by doing that, you leave structural racism in place because we could all wake up tomorrow and be non-racist and we would still have racist structures. By the 2010s, all the Jewish groups had come around and had started arguing for affirmative action, recognizing that structural racism and discrimination were broader than individualism. That's still a liberal perspective to say that the system can be refor reformed to, to challenge those, but it's a step that Jews had to make to recognize that race blindness was not actually the goal, first of all, because you don't want to negate people's experience by saying, oh, you're really white, um, but also by recognizing that the ideal of uh, race blindness has nothing to do with the reality of structures of racism. So I think the way forward, and we're seeing that again in lots of Jewish organizations, particularly younger people, is this recognition that if you're gonna fix the system, you can't just change the laws, individual laws, you can't just get rid of a few bad apples, but that you really have to understand the way structures impact um, those things. And I think that is within the capacity of liberalism, it's just that you have to make that step. Definitely a, a greater sophistication in the understanding. I think even this year. Yes. Um, well, you uh, really see that in a lot of Jewish groups now. Absolutely. Right. right. Um, so, uh, Mark, I'm going to uh, give you a chance, of course, to, to respond to everything. I just want to um, say a, a couple of more student questions that we can maybe address um, all together. Um, so, one uh, student who is a, a graduate student, a PhD student um, uh, at American, Andrew Sperling, would like to know, he feels that um, that this conversation is pushing back somewhat against the idea of black power as the reason behind a part of the uh, Black Jewish Alliance breaking up. Uh, but why has traditional scholarship, not sure what he means by that, assumed that black power was the primary catalyst um, behind, um, behind the so-called Black Jewish Alliance um, breaking up? And Mark, that is clearly a you question. I'd like to thank you for the question and thank you for saying Black Power, giving me a chance to talk about it. Absolutely. So when you say traditional, I'm assuming you're talking about the early historiography on this question. And, and in the mindset, and this plays a lot on what Cheryl was just saying, um, everything was great between white Jews and blacks and the civil rights King and Heschel marching arm in arm until those darn black nationalist, black militant, black power activists turned anti-Israel, anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic and ruined the whole thing, right? That was the traditional view. Well, when I went into the research, I began to discover that even white middle-aged male national Jewish leaders we're calling out systemic racism. Um, well, one, one was in 1960, and it was a published article that said, guess what? Um, there is increasing upset in Black America with the limits of white liberalism. And there's going to be discord. There's going to be a call for go it alone. And there's going to be a rise in anti-Semitism. Well, if white Jewish leaders were predicting this because they understood the essential limits of white allyship, then once it actually happened, it's not the Black's fault, right? So the first part of the book was, was to decenter this argument that blames Black militants for the end of an alliance, which we could even possibly say was doomed from the start based upon structural racism and the limits of, of white liberalism. And then I took it a step further because I found in the 1970s when American Jews enjoyed an ethnic religious revival, Soviet Jewry, American Zionism, Baal Tshuva, Jewish religiosity, that time and again, the sources kept referencing black power as the inspiration for Jews to finally have the courage to be public and out about their Jewish identity in ways in the 1950s, when they first made it into the white Christian suburbs and blacks didn't, that they were, they were unwilling to do. Thank you. Um, Another student question. Uh, we have uh, Noah Leibowitz, who, um, full disclosure, is uh, writing his senior thesis with me um, on, uh, on things related to this question. And I have already told him 
that he should email both of you. So I apologize in advance. <laughs> um, <laughs> I told him you're very responsive. Noah would like to know, how do we account for and respond to more materially visible forms of anti-Semitism in the black community, such as um, black true Israelite movement, uh, which was responsible for multiple anti-Semitic murders uh, as recently as last winter. I think he's thinking of Jersey City. Um, and, uh, and then a student question from Eli Leroy, uh, uh, just putting the two of them together, um, that there has recently, this is sort of the, the other side of the coin, kind of what we were saying about Farrakhan before, to what extent do you engage certain things in the other community that you find objectionable. Um, and so Eli Leroy would like to know, recently there's been a division among many Jews surrounding the Black Lives Matter movement, and in particular, their early statements about, uh, about uh, Palestinian issues um, and, and even um, uh, an earlier statement supporting BDS. Uh, so, what is this effect then on Jewish communities as a whole and how do these, I mean, he's asking Palestinian issues in general uh, or specifically, but I want to make it more general. How do these, you know, real uh, things that are seen as, as real issues and then what Noah's asking about actual violent anti-Semitism that does have a place right now uh, in corners of the black community, how is that supposed to affect the dialogue? Um, do you think, Cheryl? Well, that's a whole class in itself, it seems to me. Uh, and I don't have any quick uh, answers, except um, first of all, that that is the question, um, it seems to me, in the, in the Jewish community. So that every, when I'm invited to give talks, and I'm sure this is true for, for Mark too, in Jewish groups, they're always asking that question. We would love to get involved, but, you know, there's this issue of whatever. Um, and, and which is different from the violent anti-Semitism. So I, I grant that. But my, my response to the what do we do about the Palestinian question um, is twofold. First of all, listen to the arguments. They're not anti-Zionist. They are pro-human rights. So let's be careful not to hear every criticism of Israel as anti-Semitism. Um, but the second thing is pick your battles. Black Lives Matter is addressing something that is of absolute dire importance to our country. And to focus on one sentence in a 130 page manifesto that is in fact not there anymore is a little bit to avoid the larger subject. So it's like, oh, what about so that black person who said this anti, who repeated something that Farrakhan said? Well, those people have been saying things for a long time, but suddenly now that we are called upon to really address our own issues, we say, oh, that's too anti Semitic, I can't get involved. So I think there's been an undercurrent of anti Semitism all along that Jewish communities pick out when it's hardest to get involved and focus on that. So I think my argument would be. Let's focus on the main stuff, and we can we can agree to disagree. If we didn't disagree on some things, we would be one person, one group, right? Let's agree to disagree on some things. We're not going to organize around Israel on this, but we can organize around anti-racism. The anti-Semitism, I think, is a real challenge. But again, I don't see the Black Israelites as doing anything that the white supremacists aren't doing, and so which is to say, they are commandeering the narrative for themselves, and. Right, in that case too, Jews, white Jews have usurped the position of, of real Jews. It's the same kind of argument, and it seems to me we have to tackle it the same way, which is to say, to unearth their, the irresponsibility and the danger of their, lie, of their comments um, and critique it without saying anything about, um, you know, that they're, they're evil or, or something like that. It's, it is the same argument as white supremacists, just coming from a different perspective. So I think we have to challenge both. Interesting. Mark? Yeah, so um, first, for transparency, I, I, I want to note a couple things. First, we're moving away from academic scholarship in history and into the current moment. I often give the joke, as an historian, it's tough enough to predict the past. How can I predict the future? You know, 
Um, so I just wanted to say that, that I'm taking my knowledge of history now to apply it to a, to a particular moment. And the other is actually quite personal. Um, and, and you had mentioned the black Israelite in New Jersey who had committed that violent act when the FBI, um, after his death, because he was, he was killed in that altercation, searched through his social media profiles. It found out that six months earlier, he had put out a, a threatening tweet against me. Um, he had apparently seen or referenced a book and considered me blasphemous for having made contentions on blacks and Jews. So um, th thankfully the, the FBI intervened and they've, they've been able to, to remove that from the internet. So I'm, I am speaking as an historian in the present and, and as one who's been, been personally involved with that in, in that sense. Since I get this question all the time, I reached out to colleagues who actually are engaged in this and to those sort of white leftists who, who, are, who are involved you know, I say, how do you respond to all of this? Um, and, and, and what's the point is, is what I get, right? If the point is anti-racist work, then, then let's, let's focus on the point. Um, and when I reach out to, to colleagues in the black Jewish community, they're like, you know, if I needed every white Jewish person to agree with me on every issue and not be racist, I'd never have an ally in the Jewish community. And there's a complexity when you're coming from communities of color in dealing and holding with a lot of internal contradictions. Um, in fact, Black Lives Matter is um, more a slogan and a belief than an organized movement. There's multiple civil rights organizations that coalesce around that hashtag. And the 40,000 word platform that had 200 words that were critical of Israel and Zionism was written by three people in one of the organizations. So the notion that that would be lifted as an opportunity to disassociate with the cause um, is deeply problematic and going to the earlier question shows some of the limits that liberalism uh, may offer which means i think now is the time for a reinvention of, of liberalism mm. oh. <laughs> good luck with that let's get through november 3rd first uh, <laughs> um, so uh, we of course have um, a lot of uh, questions in the chat and and a number of them um, are a number of the the questioners are asking about or are sort of making statements about um, encouraging the american jewish community to call out anti-semitism more and to um uh and to learn this history the good and the bad so to get back to what uh you're saying mark uh, about learning about history that it's not, this isn't happening in a vacuum as part of the conversation. It is completely informed um, by our work as, as historians. Uh, and so sort of encouraging the Jewish community to take a, um, to take the example of Black Lives Matter um, as in a way uh, you were saying earlier, Mark, and, and I think we all agree that the Soviet jury movement, et cetera, really learned a lot from black power um, in terms of, you know, taking pride in your ethnic affiliations, your identity. And so seeing that in a positive, constructive sense um, and really standing up and not being afraid to say when there are litanies of, um, of xenophobias and, you know, homophobia, Islamophobia, whatever. And uh, what I have noted is uh, a lot of people in speeches, et cetera, leaving out anti-Semitism, having this long list. So there, a lot of the questioners are, are asking uh, whether you think that, the, that American Jews should, should not be so shy about both talking about their accomplishments in the past and also calling out people and not saying, oh, well, and I, I agree with you, Cheryl, from a, from a sort of practical standpoint, you can't get fixated always on one line and 139 page document, but it's also, it's also important. It, you know, we can't ignore it, can't minimize it. So how do we do that? Um, so Cheryl, I'll start with you. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And it was the same, well, Yes, I think it's a, it's a real problem. And I think everybody has to draw a bright line for themselves. You know, if the Black Lives Matter movement were homophobic, for example, I would say, I can't support this movement because of this. So your bright line is your bright line. And if your bright line is Zionism or whatever, then that's that. But um, I think you do have to pick your, you have to focus on what your, your particular battles are. Um, 
having said that, I think that anti-Semitism is a real thing and we do have to respond to it. I think the question is how we respond to it. So most of the, much of the objection about anti-Semitism is rooted, is, is expressed in ways like, we were there for you, why aren't you there for us? Or that's a black person who is anti-Semitic, we need these other black people to speak up and say that it's not anti-Semitic, that, that they're not anti-Semitic. And both of those are problematic. It's one thing to say this is anti-Semitic and I'm offended or I'm hurt or this is how it hurts us. It's another thing to say there's a quid pro quo um, or to say, ev I need every black person to stand up and disavow this person as if all black people are the same. Any more than we all stood up as Jews and said, by the way, I repudiate this white supremacist because I'm white, or I repudiate this Jewish racist because I'm Jewish, right? These, the ways that we are approaching the challenge that anti-Semitism poses, it seems to me, how we frame the question is really important. And as long as we frame it as you owe us or whatever, or we are the most important issue, I think is dangerous. If you focus on it as a problem, then I think it's really, really important that we address it and make sure that other people recognize it too. Thank you. Mark? Uh, I agree. I'll just give us time for more questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we have a lot of, we have a lot more questions. I'll, I'll ask uh, one more also um, from a student, but a number of people have brought this up. Um, asking how this conversation, even today, is, has changed as a result of people's greater awareness of the diversity of the Jewish community uh, in America and diversity in, in so many ways. Um, and, uh, you know, a couple of people have, have even questioned the racial makeup of this panel, um, which kind of assumes that people can tell what somebody's racial makeup is by looking at them um, and making assumptions, which isn't necessarily the case. I'll just throw that, that out there. Um, so, um, uh, you know, uh, and, and we, by the way, uh, in constructing this panel, um, the, uh, the people, the organizers, Michael Brenner and Pam Adel and I have reached out to a couple of people who identify as scholars of color from the Jewish community. Um, so, and not everybody is available because everyone's Zooming all the time. Uh, so I wanted you to know that. And we also have some events um, coming up that are planned in, uh, through the Jewish Studies program at American University um, that uh, will hopefully, that we're hoping in conversation will feature uh, a particular scholar of Black Jewish relations who is himself uh, identifies as a Jew of color um, and he's Black um, and, and he's Jewish and, uh, and also a former uh, American University student, one of our alumni who is, uh, who is herself African American and is Jewish and is now in rabbinical school. Um, so we're hoping to, you know, we're, we're constantly working to expand this conversation. So, um, you know, how is that going forward, do you think, going to change this conversation, Mark? Yeah, so first of all, I'd like to affirm that question and that critique, and, and I'll, I'll own it and I'll personalize it. When I finished the Black Power book, um, and I hadn't done the epilogue and it was just getting its sort of final review, um, I had lunch with Ilana Kaufman, who is the founder and, and, and president of the Jews of Color Initiative, uh, Black Jewish Women. I shared this story because it became the epilogue of the book. And over this lunch where we're talking, you know, about race in, in America, you know, she, she, she took me to task. She said, you wrote 200 pages on Blacks and Jews and not a single page on a Black Jew. And then I sort of came up with all the, <laughs> all the arguments I could. And, and she said, look, go back through each of your chapters. And instead of viewing causality, what causes history to happen the way it did, as a function of America or the 1960s or black power, which were the three, my three frames for the book, she said, how about white privilege? What would happen if you reread and rewrote each chapter through a racial lens? You actually don't even need a black Jew to talk about the way in which Jewish whiteness matters. And she was absolutely right. So what I put into the epilogue is there needs to be a new version of this book. Um, it probably needs to be written by a Jew of color, I, I think. Um, and, and in terms of the historiography, what we, we as academic historians do, writing and rewriting generation after generation, I think this, this, this is the moment now for, for that new revision of our understanding of the past. 
Um, and then to quickly answer your first question, um, since the, the murder of Floyd, the interest of white liberal suburban Jews in critically examining their understanding of themselves and their past, I've never seen it in 25 years. I wrote a new lecture. I have a formal title, but the informal title is Jews are racist. And I, I do 350 years of it. I never would have even thought about writing that lecture. I could have never delivered it in a synagogue environment without getting blacklisted forever. And now the demand is overwhelming. So I do see, at least from my experience as an educator and a scholar in this, a palpable difference now than I've ever seen. Hmm. I would also push back against that title because of just the generalization. I mean, it, that's kind of an incredible generalization. Um, uh, so um, speaking of the moment, we're almost at that moment where we're almost done. So I'm going to ask you the last question, um, getting back to the first session of our, uh, of, of, of our series here. Um, we had um, medieval historian uh, Paula Tartikoff um, very articulately speaking about the anti-Semitic ideology of medieval Christian Europe. Uh, that saw Jews at, at the center of conspiracies um, to destroy society, all sorts of conspiracy theory, and even, imagine this, harnessing the power of disease uh, to weaken others. Uh, crazy idea. In today's world, um, including the United States, um, we've seen conspiracy theories just going through the roof, um, even accusing Jews of responsibility for the pandemic. So getting back to something Mark said earlier, as historians, how do you see your role? Um, what can we do by studying history to help uh, improve the present? And what would be some helpful steps on, on all sides to use our knowledge of, of the past to improve the situation? We have like one minute. Uh, I'll, I'll answer briefly and then I'll leave some for Mark because I think Mark touched on exactly the, that answer, which is to say, um, he inspired me, by the way, to go look back at the question about Jews and whiteness uh, in my own work. And what I try to do is to say, let's learn from the past. The, the failures in the Jewish community, not speaking about the black community, but the failures in the Jewish community during the civil rights movement were exactly the failures to take race seriously and to take the fact that we are a diverse people seriously enough to interrogate those questions within ourselves and it seems to me that the more that we can bring that out now and say that was a failure and we need to re we need to address it i think that is the only way forward and i think mark is right this is the first time that i have seen jews themselves try to undertake this and i think our responsibility is to undergird that and say yes here's where it operates here's where it operated and we need to um, be different moving forward thank you I, I write history i'm an historian not a social scientist because i want to try to discover a time and a place different from my own so i tend to resist the idea that i'm writing with a presentist interest because i'm i'm interested in the present that said of course especially with this particular topic there's a whole lot of relevance uh, in the present and so for me it's about historical memory it's about all of us and, and scholars have to do this too we have to critique the way we remember things, how we put it together, and the ways in which that can actually be informed more by present day issues and less about what actually happened. So when the scholar can go back in time and offer a more vivid, complex, and truthful understanding, that can then move to the present day and offer a new perspective. It's so helpful. I can't thank you both enough. Um, this is, I have a feeling, as I've already said, only one in many, many events, conversations, not only uh, at AU, but everywhere that are going on. And I just think, you know, more sunlight is better, uh, more transparency, more conversation, more education, more research, more dialogue, um, people talking to each other and being open and honest about what has worked and what hasn't. So uh, thank you again. Um, in that vein, I'll remind everyone here who's, uh, who's an American citizen over the age of 18 to vote on November 3rd. And, uh, and really, thank you so much. Thank you to Pam Nadell and Michael Brenner and the uh, College of Arts and Sciences and American University for sponsoring this kind of conversation. And have a great day and stay well.
Thank you. Thank you, you all.